it, it changed how our farm looked and right. functioned in a lot of different ways. But it's it's amazing how, at the end of the day, um, what makes us strong, what makes our cattle get fatter, is the diversity that we create in our land. Welcome back to Gage Hill Crafts. I'm Sarah Scully, and I'm here with Joseph Morell of Eastman Farm, and we're over in Barnard, Vermont. Um, we'll tell you a little bit more about our location in a minute, um, but welcome, Joseph. Thanks for taking the time yeah. to be on the show. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so Joseph is a meat farmer. Um, he raises pastured uh, beef and pork on his farm here. Um, and I always like to start with, how did you get into farming? I know that your your family's been in Vermont for a number of generations. Yep. Um, is that something that you grew up with then? Yeah. Yeah. Um, both of my parents grew up on dairy farms in the Northeast Kingdom. Okay. Um, in, in the era of the small, diversified um, farm. Mm -hmm. Not not a lot exported off from the farm. A lot of subsistence going on. Okay. Um, my dad was a uh, French Canadian, first generation American. Mm. Um, my mom is an old Yankee family that okay. came to Vermont in the yeah. 1760s. So, kind of a, a new and old Vermont coming together. Right. Where was, um, I've been li listening to Brave Little State, the podcast, uh -huh. yep. a lot lately, and yep. they, they had an episode a while back on um, the French influence in Vermont. Mm -hmm. I'm curious where your father's from originally. He's from Quebec. Okay. Yep. 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 And uh, so they both had farms, and then it was in the era of the, you know, immediately after World War II, uh, an era that saw a lot of, of those small, diversified farms disappear. Right. Um, and so they both sought work in Chittenden County, mm -hmm. um, but really didn't, didn't make a transition to the urban uh, part of Chittenden County and stayed in the rural outskirts in Underhill. Yeah, that's and, good. <laughs> um, and so kept our toe in farming uh, in that uh, we ran some beef cattle on some leased land next to us, had mm -hmm. chickens, pigs, goats, you know, dabbled. Um, right. You know, learned how to milk a cow when I was super young, mm -hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> and birthing and <laughs> all these things. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think it, the part of it is in Chittenden County and in that era – I think that we're, you know, there's this whole focus now on trying to keep young people in Vermont. Um, I think the message for me that I got pretty loud and clear was that I should try to get as best education as I possibly could and leave as soon as I could. Um, and that farming definitely was not something that had a future. Um, you know, it was definitely an era of uh, a draconian sort of decrease in the amount of dairy farms even. Right. And so saw, I saw a lot of land in Chittenden County, prime land, mm -hmm. um, developed. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, I did my due diligence. I went to school and got a good education and I left. Um, but I, I really had, uh, the, the longer I was away, uh, the longer I was away from the land and the relationship with the animals, uh, the more... Um, the more kind of unsettled I felt. Mm. Um, and so I eventually kind of had to come back. Yeah. Um, and it was around the time that, you know, my wife and I were, you know, had our first child. Mm -hmm. So came back, um, wanted to figure out a way of raising beef that could really help the land uh, and be optimal for them mm -hmm. and produce an amazing product that I had never experienced before. Um, you know, I, people had even, you know, by the time I had come back, people were dabbling in trying to get grass fed, uh, farming. There was definitely a little bit of a craze for it. Mm -hmm. Um, but the product was really lacking. Um, mm. and so it led us into this journey, which eventually led to, um, a holistic plan grazing, a holistic management, uh, where you're really looking at everything, it changed how our farm looked and right. functioned in a lot of different ways, but it's it's amazing how, at the end of the day, um, what makes us strong, what makes our cattle get fatter, is the diversity that we create in our land. Mm -hmm. And and I don't think of myself as a meat farmer, really. I think of myself as a grass farmer, um, as a solar collector, 
Right. Um, and so it's it's managing these rhythms. Mm -hmm. And one of the most amazing things about the holistic management um, was developing the grazing plan where you're managing rest periods. Mm -hmm. And so you're really optimizing the life cycle of your grasses. Right. And, you know, that also goes for our haying. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, um, we don't, uh, we don't stockpile a lot of manure. Mm -hmm. We keep cattle moving throughout the year even. We unroll round bales on snow sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we chose a very hardy breed right. so that, that that would be an option. Mm -hmm. um, but we, you know, we use a lot of um, very subtle practices on our grass and our hay. Mm -hmm. So we bring back uh, sea minerals mm -hmm. um, in the form of fish and uh, a product called sea crop, which is basically has a lot of the sea minerals without the salt. Okay, um, interesting. Yeah. We use uh, we use biodynamic preparations, which are essentially uh, cultures for the mm -hmm. land, mm -hmm. bacterial cultures, um, and have for years. And so mm -hmm. we're just it's a it's a process where it's not a it's not a sudden leap, but it's working with the the land and the animals to basically renovate land that had been right. uh, not used intensively. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've put together uh, leased land uh, as well as our home farm and mm -hmm. created a pretty good cycle. Right. We do about five grazes a year. Mm -hmm. So every piece of land sees a cow five times, mm -hmm. um, but for short periods of time, right. intense activity and then a long rest period. Right. That's what we do with our sheep too. Yeah. We're, we're, I just have a home flock now, you yep. know, not, not breeding or anything, but yep. yeah, it's the same concept Yeah. because we're on a slope and it, you know, the soil's acidic, so it can't take a lot of punishment, yep. a lot of overworking, Right. all those things. So right. Yeah, it's, it's the continuous grazing. That's really the tough part. Mm -hmm. It really, um, it really is, uh, it destroys that diversity. Yeah. Um, almost as soon as we had started, um, practicing the holistic management, we had dung beetles. Mm -hmm. um, we just noticed our cow, you know, the, the manure was disappearing mm -hmm. at a much, you know, much faster. Uh, when we would unroll the bales on these, you know, we were essentially clearing woods in some places, cutting back really mm -hmm. young, early regeneration. We would unroll these bales, and in the first few years, you'd still see straws of hay out there in, you know, late June. Right. Uh, now it's like May. It's like, where where did that hay go? Uh -huh. Like that waste hay and, and um, uh, you know, manure from the winter. Right. It's just, it's that biological activity just gets right. ramped up. Yep, and gets reabsorbed and and sequest carbon sequestration yep. and all those good things. Yep. Yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. And we've, we, I mean, Very we've cool. watched land that actually we started out with that was super compacted, uh, wetland, um, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of mucky, and and we've seen it actually go completely in the other direction, mm -hmm. uh, just clover uh, have, being becoming well drained, mm -hmm. and, and this is without tillage. Right. Which is just, I mean, it's mind blowing. Or excavating work or you right. know, sculpting, exactly. any of that exactly. stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Which disturbs the yep. soil. Yeah. That's yep. really cool. Yeah. You can do it sort of passively, intentionally, but pa more passively. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, it's like they, the, 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 the life in the soil has the ability to do so much more work than we can do. Right. You know? Yeah. Especially when stuff. you take the carbon into it. Culture, culture, cultivating and cultivating that. That's very cool. I want to talk about the breed of um, cattle that you keep. Right. Um, so tell me a little bit about them. They're, they're so cute. We'll get a picture up for you. Um, I call them Oreo cows. <laughs> so black and yeah, white. <laughs> yeah. I have a hard time with the Oreo cow part just because, you know, the hydrogenated oils. I know. That, it's but... <laughs> terrible. Don't eat Oreos. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, they're, they're very... Uh, they're an amazing, hardy, uh, beautiful animal. Mm -hmm. uh, we chose them because unlike Angus and Hereford, which are a typical beef breed, mm -hmm. um, it's an old English breed, which brings um, uh, high uh, fat content in their mm -hmm. milk, mm -hmm. um, small boned, so higher yield, carcass yield, especially for grass fed. Yeah. Um, but this was a breed that hadn't been tinkered with a lot, mm -hmm. hadn't become part of feedlot programs. Mm -hmm. And over generations, um, with the more intensely uh, commercialized breeds, uh, breeding choices would be made after grain was involved. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big distortion. If you right. try to take that genetics back to the grass, mm -hmm. it, you're, you, it's really uneven uh, kind of outcomes. And even right. with the Galloway, we have been vigorous in our uh, culling. 
so that we are really getting animals that are essentially nativized to our grasses, mm -hmm. but also are really wholeheartedly returning to a, a body type that is um, something that you just in general don't see a lot of anymore and mm -hmm. but there are people doing it and there are old there are definitely old school angus out there and they're definitely old school here for there's a right. gentleman just down the road who has a herd uh one of the oldest organic uh herds and he's kind of going out now or dwindling but it's really amazing it's just mm -hmm. super short super stocky wide animals yeah. um not putting that big height on because there's not the grain to fill out that frame mm -hmm. um and so we're seeing animals that are that are finishing out from you know a thousand fifty mm -hmm. to you know twelve hundred pounds and um, on grass and twenty six twenty eight months. Yeah. And the thing that that finally uh, just started to blow my mind and it was you know it's 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 happened like I said gradually you see these changes but um, we just started seeing our ribeyes with with the fat all the way through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we really, we really started to notice that when it came to cooking, that we didn't need to all of a sudden put on the grass-fed hat, like mm -hmm. we're, we're like we're cooking antelope or something, right? Or um, reindeer, or <laughs> yeah. or you know, what is it, uh, um, elk or something? That's right. just uh, completely all lean. muscle, no fat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I am very happy with um, w the quality that we've achieved, and and also mm -hmm. the consistency, because mm -hmm. that's the thing. It's that we're really trying to get. Animals that are super hardy, easy moms, right? Um, yeah, and that are able to stay on the move. Mm -hmm. These are animals that are not—they're not trained to a barn life, mm -hmm. or a, a yard, or a feed lot, or a containment. Right. Um, they are really on the move. They can go up and down all, all the hills. Yeah. 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 Yep. And it's—it's exactly. it's absolutely amazing to see them, you know, in deep snow, mm -hmm. and they're short like an animal, mm -hmm. uh, running around, mm -hmm. like completely <laughs> luxuriating right. in the just. You know, a beautiful, crisp winter day. Yeah. Uh, and it's just like that kind of vitality is right. what, you know, I, I pulled out a calf this morning and it had, you know, it had, it was breech and it was just, uh, uh, you know, we, we had to work at it for a while. The calf was stressed when it came out. Yeah. But it's just like the life force in that animal is so strong mm -hmm. uh, that it really was working. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were working too to, you know, rub them down and because mm -hmm. the mom was still tired, but it's just like th that animal's going to live. Yeah. And, uh, that's just powerful. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, we, we have, you know, of course we have coyotes. Mm -hmm. We have never lost a calf to coyotes mm -hmm. because their life force is so strong. The moms know what to do. The herds know what to do. They have a real group identity, mm -hmm. uh, which I love, you know, because yeah. it's like they're my team. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we handle them a fair amount. Mm -hmm. When I first basically was like, oh, I'm going to grass. I'm gonna just going to do grass. You know, of course, growing up, we used to pasture animals and we'd bring grain to acclimate them to us so that we could touch them and pet them. And, and I said, geez, how is this going to work if all I have is grass? Except for the fact that if you move them every day, they know you. They get to know you. And they know what, oh, how good. the guy good. with the fresh pasture. We should follow. Let's, okay, everybody get in line. Let's yeah, all yeah. go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's like a party when they get into that fresh stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's, they they are very calm. And I think that's part of it too, is it, it part of it is breeding and, and, and culling and, and making sure you have the right genetics. Part of it is nutrition too. And it's mm -hmm. like that nutrition ends up creating a much more balanced, calm individual, mm -hmm. which when it comes to sorting, when it comes to even going to the slaughterhouse or getting on a trailer, yep. that ability to stay calm mm -hmm. is huge. And that yeah. translates all the way through to the meat quality. Right. Um, yep. Because when you're frying it up, you're, you're basically getting a tender piece of meat. Right. No stress hormones and better for the animal and yep. safer for the farmer to handle. And all Everybody those along the yeah. line. Yep. Yeah. That's yep. fantastic. Yeah. Um, I also want to talk about your pork because Mangalitsa pigs are close to my heart. I've never raised pigs myself, mm -hmm. but we have a really good friend over in England. Hi, mm -hmm. James, if you're watching. Um, <laughs> who He started Treely Farm, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the top-rated charcuterie in the UK. Oh, wow. And, and sort of his home, his pet breed was Mangalitsa pigs. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So I'm familiar with them. Yeah. Um, so how did you get turned into Ideally for suited for um, dry cure. Yeah. Really, ideally. Um, you know, we had in a similar vein. We had we were feeling pretty good about our beef program, and we wanted to 
We wanted to have the diversity. Also, we wanted to be able to start taking advantage of, um, you know, essentially broadening our farm because, you know, we have, we're essentially renovating these old farms. Mm -hmm. These old farms come with tons of apple trees. Mm -hmm. And so we started to partner with Fable Farm um, to, to essentially, they're using the trees to make cider, but there are so many other benefits to having those trees. Mm -hmm. And, and so it, the more we get into uh, growing perennials, having pigs, um, you know, our pigs eat all of the, of the apple waste from mm -hmm. the cider production, mm -hmm. um, and grape and anything else that comes from that, which is an awesome thing. Yep. Also, they're able to, you know, we're able to move them around, mm -hmm. um, which is, is great. But as we were, as we were considering getting into pigs, we were, we tried various, uh, crosses that people use nowadays, uh, and found them really kind of lacking. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's just, it's the it's the quality of the fat of the mungalitsa. Mm -hmm. It's the darkness of the meat. Mm -hmm. uh, they are a little bit more slow growing, uh, but it they're an incredible hardy animal. Again, mm -hmm. an animal that can be outdoors. Um, yeah. You know, foraging for itself. Mm -hmm. We move them. We, you know, we we do both pasture and woods. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, woods in the heat of the summer is really ideal for them. Oh yeah. Yep. Um, but we also, throughout the year, feed them hay. I mm -hmm. mean, because our hay is is a is a pretty good hay that we've been working on over the years, um, we find that they love love good hay. Mm -hmm. um, and so keeping that chlorophyll. So even when they're in the woods, we'll we'll actually give them a round bale mm -hmm. um, and let them have at it. Yeah. And it helps keep. I mean, it, that chlorophyll, all those minerals, it's mm -hmm. going to help keep them healthy. The fiber and everything. Yes. Yeah. yeah totally. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm friends with Walter Jeffries of Sugar. Mountain. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and he does his um, he does all grass-fed pork. And, yeah, you know, gets these people that are incredulous. You don't feed any grain to your pigs. Right, right, he goes, right. No, yeah. I feed them whey and I feed them. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, really, I saw, really cool. Yeah, um, so, totally. So I love to see this movement, you know, continuing across various farms. Um, speaking of various farms, talk a little bit about this kind of cooperative farming structure mm -hmm. that you guys have. With, right. You mentioned Fable, and there's a couple of other, you, other right, guys kind right, of working right, together. Right, right. So when we started farming in Barnard in uh, 2007, um, Fable Farm started their CSA, actually planted it, mm -hmm. um, in town. And they and were mostly vegetables at that point, They were right? just a, they were a vegetable CSA. I think mm -hmm. that year they had their, the first round was like, I think 20 people signed mm -hmm. up for their vegetable CSA. Um, so Randy and Lisa Robar, um, they were starting um, Kiss the Cow Farm, which originally was Hawks Hill. It's called Hawks Hill. Mm -hmm. At the in their home, they turned their garage into a, a raw milk dairy. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and and Justin Park, who um, now has Hartwood Farm, he was interning with Fable Farm in those early years too. So we were all kind of getting started in a very different models of farming, mm -hmm. um, looking at different ways of connecting with customers. Uh, mm -hmm. Looking at different ways of interacting with the soil and scale diversity of farming, um, and so for me, what that meant was immediately I had a full diet at my disposal mm -hmm. um, that was really a, a small group of people with uh, a, an incredible amount of integrity, mm -hmm. and so for me that was part of a um, you know a taste journey, uh, a health journey, um, as well as a social journey. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, it was interesting meeting this old timer up here on the hill who, um, uh, Joe Leducer, who rented an apartment to, to Randy and Lisa when mm -hmm. they first came and encouraged them, um, loaned the land to Fable Farm for their mm -hmm. first CSA, mm -hmm. just an incredible mentor. Right. Um, and I remember talking to him and him just saying, you know, it was amazing when I first came here that there were five farms in this valley and that we had this mutual support. Um, you know, obviously, if you're in a bind, somebody would help and, and everyone would come together. But he's like, it was beyond that. It was the social aspect. Right. It was this ability to, like, check in with each other, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, not be alone in this. Mm -hmm. And that really appealed, even mm -hmm. though I'm, I'm, I'm pretty introverted <laughs> <laughs> and have been for my, most of my life. But um, and so that kind of led, uh, led us to have a lot of conversations and so Barnard had worked for years to 
look into the future about the Clark Farm, which mm-hmm. is just across the street from here, um, thinking about ways to conserve it because it was such an iconic farm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so between the town and the Vermont Land Trust and a bunch of community members, it was the very same year that we all were starting our farms that the Vermont Land Trust conserved the Clark Farm. Oh, great. Yeah. And so Dwight Clark continued to farm it for, I think, another three years, three or four years uh, before he died. And when he died, the valley got a lot quieter. And I think there was this sense um, for me and I think for others in our group that there was a real void. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, the land trust has an incredible program for placing farmers on the land. But we really were looking at this huge farm and saying, well, what are they going to put here? Like, right. who are they going to invite in? And well, and what one person is going to be maybe able to right. run this larger right. operation. Right, yeah. right. It almost necessarily would have been a much more um, large scale operation. Mm-hmm. And so we kind of started this process of working with the land trust, partnering with them, partnering with various donors in town to figure out a way of um, of, of, of of allowing these four farms um, at a relatively small scale to share this mm-hmm. space mm-hmm. Um, and to use that extra land, that extra access um, to to maybe grow our farms, uh, get us further down on mm-hmm. this journey. Mm-hmm. And so that's how it essentially started. And then in 2013, the Fable Farm moved their CSA pickup. They, they essentially... Uh, They were doing it in the middle of Barnard Mm -hmm. um, and moved it out here to the Clark Farm. And at that point, we decided that we'd been working long enough together for a while. We're Mm -hmm. all sharing this land. Mm -hmm. We worked well together, liked each other. Um, We said, geez, let's um, let's see if we can do a market together. Mm -hmm. And so that's when we started Feast and Field which eventually became, you know, Feast and Field Farmers. And we created an LLC essentially as a, um, as a cooperative organization mm-hmm. so that we can manage the market. Um, yeah. And then in 2016, we built this barn over here as a way of uh, a kind of a, a transition towards uh, more value added. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this, this building is a winery primarily uh, mm-hmm. in, a, in, a, in a venue, but it has a, a kitchen that is a commercial grade kitchen, Mm -hmm. which allows Randy to have a a licensed creamery and able to produce his ice cream in it. Um, It allows Fable Farm to continue its catering business, Mm -hmm. um, servicing the feast and field and private meals and weddings and uh, other forms of gathering. So we're all still working together. Um, We're still putting the market on together and it's it's really been an amazing journey. Mm -hmm. And every time we put on a market, it, it, it blows my mind yeah. <laughs> because it's just, it's busy. Yep. Um, it's really fun. And people so respond to mm-hmm. coming out and being on a farm. Um, and it's, and it's such a beautiful place. The yeah. Clark farm is, is a unique and beautiful place. Mm-hmm. And I'm just so glad to be part of not only the preservation of it, because I'm a, I'm a huge, like growing up in Chittenden County, the Vermont land trust was, I mean, those guys were my heroes, basically, and they yeah. still are. They've done so much to conserve. Um, for those of you who don't know, Vermont Land Trust uh, places easements on agricultural yep. land so yep. that it can stay agricultural right? Um, to prevent it from being developed. So, right, right. Yeah. But, I mean, I think the thing is is that there's only, and I think this is where the Vermont Land Trust is now, is that there's only so much you can do. You can prevent land from being developed, but that's no, no longer a proactive way of encouraging or promoting sure. it's only continued use. Yeah. yeah it's only and so step. I think that they've become so much more nuanced mm-hmm. in the last handful of years, really. And, you know, we're, we're a project that, that is kind of an experiment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they have several experiments uh, uh, in various forms mm-hmm. around the state yeah. um, where they're really trying stuff and, and seeing if they can encourage in various ways uh, a kind mm-hmm. of rebirth of farming right. in, in a new scale and a, a new form. Right. But also I think too, to get people to understand it's, it's not just about driving by that conserved farm. I think they're really focused also on encouraging people to be on that farm, mm-hmm. to experience the places a little bit more deeply. Right. Do and, a workshop, take yeah. a cooking class, mm-hmm. have a meal, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. something. Yeah. And I think that nuance is, 
I mean, I think that's we're we're looking to do more of that in the future too, mm-hmm. you know, because um, being out in the fields, taking those walks through the forest, seeing the animals on the land, is really what we need more of mm-hmm. because there is so little understanding in general uh, of what it takes to grow food here and what it takes to create a healthy environment where mm-hmm. the water that's running off from that farm is clean. Mm-hmm. Um, the food that you're eating is uh, life-giving mm-hmm. and healthy. Yeah. And I think that, um, and, and, and not being educated, I think it makes people that much more vulnerable to the kind of, you know, what, what I refer to as greenwashing, right. um, which, which is occurring regularly mm-hmm. because, um, you know, advertisers are savvy. And sure. They figure out what words resonate with people or mm-hmm. what ideas if or I images. If I put eco in front of it, I can yeah, sell the product. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah, sure. Whether sure. that product's right. Right. any good for anybody or the environment. Yeah. Right, right. And I mean, I think there's, you know, and, and, and various lobbying has made, um, you know, has made the system a little bit rigged. I mean, three quarters of the 100% grass-fed beef that's labeled as a U.S. product in this country is not from this country. Mm-hmm. So the ability to do things like that legally uh, essentially is a is a is a is a little bit of a hurdle right. for anybody farming on a small scale in Vermont. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, and hoping to make not just a living wage, but you know, a good living for your family right, and support right. your family right, and right. and all of that. Yeah, right. I w- it was occurring to me this morning, and I don't know why I hadn't thought about this, but this is such an interesting this model of cooperative farming that you have is so different from how it used to be with you right. know a rich landowner who would have a farm manager right. who would have employees. Right. And, you know, that worked fine. For a generation or two. Sure. But <laughs> um, but you don't have those rich landowners right, here right. anymore. Right, no right. no one farmer can afford to buy, right. you know, the 500-acre the farm. Right, so, right, right. And maintain the huge barns and, and right, all, right. This, all the stuff. So you have to kind of come at yep. it from another angle. And yep. I'm just really excited that it's been successful for you all. And, yeah, and yeah. 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 No, we're still working at it, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's the thing. It's and I yeah. think that's the thing about farming is is, is that it is it's a spiritual journey. It's a, it's a <laughs> you know, it's an economic journey. Yeah, it's sure. like it's it's really uh, it's a it's a it's a whole lifestyle. And, you yeah. know, I think part of it and I think part of growing up in Vermont and having this background that I have is that it's it's really about persistence. Mm-hmm. Um and I think it's about being around. And it's funny because when we first moved to town, you know, there's some old timers around and, and they just said, well, that sounds nice. Right. Well, we hope right. we hope it works out. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and so the fact that we're 10 years in um, and we're yeah. still here, mm-hmm. you know, they're starting to say, oh, huh. Uh-huh. That <laughs> seemed to be okay. Yeah. yeah. I love that in Vermont. I learned really. So I was born here, but my parents moved away when I was young. So I didn't grow up mm-hmm. with this kind of culture. But what I love is that if you say, I'm going to do this, blah, 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 yeah. they'll go, hmm, yeah, you could do that. Yeah. But if you actually want advice from someone who yeah. knows more, then you say, what would you do? Right. <laughs> you right. Say, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> otherwise you're just going to get a. Yeah. Hmm, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, yeah, the, we'll see if That's you're great. still around doing sure. that. Yeah, yeah. sounds interesting. Good luck. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> totally. That's totally. great. Well, thanks again for, for making time. We will link to uh, your farm, and people can order your meats mm-hmm. um, yeah. and get, you know, CSA-type, you know, bulk orders and things like that, yep, too, yep, if you're interested. Yep, Do yep. you ship out of state? You know, we have. With, uh-huh. with things that are higher value things, I think right. it makes the most sense. So, sure. you know, you know, a whole tenderloin for Christmas is a great thing, or bacon. Right. You know, people will send bacon because it's yeah. just, like, yeah. incredible. And, you know. <laughs> Who doesn't love bacon? Yeah. yeah. But um, we, the Kiss the Cow has a farm store, and mm-hmm. we send stuff, product through there, and, we, of course, the market, and we do on-farm pickup. Right, and, yeah. And just, it's the having that loyal group of people that get it. Sure. That basically, they, I mean, and I think that's the thing in our consumer world, loyalty is not something we, you know, it's... Mm-hmm. We necessarily I think we're not prioritize. taught anymore yeah you know I growing up it was all television advertisements and it was just what whatever's new and shiny right right is what you go towards yeah or whatever's exactly. the fad or whatever right. you know so but I think this, people you know this are, thing of like groceries okay yeah. I'm gonna go to this farmer's market and right. I'm always gonna get steak from this yeah. guy and I'm always right. gonna get my eggs from this lady right and, right you know yeah 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 <laughs> yeah but it's interesting to see the, you know people essentially progress in their journey mm-hmm. and start saying well, geez you know I've 
I'm going to have to have this on hand all the time. Right. You know, yeah. making that realization, which Absolutely. is awesome. So if you're not in Vermont or you're not local, I do encourage you to go to your local farmer's market and support your local farmers. Of course, you're going to get fresher um, produce and uh, more healthy options um, yeah. and stuff that actually tastes like what it's supposed to taste like yeah, yeah. instead of something that's been sitting in cold storage for months and months. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And embrace the journey of understanding how it's made. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Visit a farm if you can. Totally. It's absolutely worthwhile. Totally. Good. Well, thank you again. Yes. Blessings. Great. Thank you so yes. much. Thank you. And thank you guys for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Cheers.